I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review, and this is the Book Review Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Liz Moore. She's the author of the 2020 novel, Long Bright River, as well as one of this summer's best-selling novels, The God of the Woods. A note for listeners, Liz and I are going to talk generally about her book, but towards the end of this episode, there's going to be a clearly demarcated spoiler section. After that, we're going to talk about the ending, among other things, and if you're still reading the book or if you're hoping to read it, you can just stop then and then come back and listen to the rest when you're done. Liz, welcome to the Book Review Podcast. Thank you. So Liz, your book is a, it's a mystery. It's a book about class. It's a book about summer camp. It's a book about men and women. That's me describing it. Why don't you tell us uh, a little bit of what The God of the Woods is about? So The God of the Woods tells the story of the Venlar family, who are a very wealthy dynastic fictional family who've built essentially a mansion in the wilderness of the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. In the 1970s, they send their own daughter to the summer camp that they have also founded on the ground, but very quickly she disappears from the summer camp. And the catch is that she's not the first child of theirs to have gone missing because 14 years earlier, their own son went missing from the same grounds, although not the camp itself. So it's kind of a dual mystery with an upstairs, downstairs thing going on because a lot of the people who come under suspicion are in the family, but uh, then some other people who come under suspicion are members of the local working class community who staff the camp and the house. So that's the elevator pitch. But yeah, you're right. It delves into a lot of different themes aside from its story as well. For those listeners who are not East Coasters, maybe, to, what are the Adirondacks? Where are they? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about them. The Adirondacks are mountains in the northern part of New York State. And they were initially pretty, it's tough to say, uninhabited. Native American tribes, the Iroquois and the Algonquin tribes, used them as hunting grounds for millennia. But European settlers came to populate them in the early 1800s. And then they were discovered by the wealthy, by wealthy families in the United States as a kind of summer playground in the late 1800s, which is when the Adirondack Park was formed. And we go from there. And what is Adirondack? park is that like a it's not a national park what it's is it? not it's a state park it's a preserve and it was founded in i believe 1896 although somebody's going to tell me it was a year or two before or after that but it is now protected lands but like all land in the u.s its history is very fraught because essentially it wasn't made protected until wealthy families in the u.s had discovered it and in quote-unquote protecting it that act displaced a lot of the working class families who'd been making a living there for a century before. So it was ethically complicated. A true American story. Right, exactly. what you're saying. Yes. And you set the God of the Woods in the Adirondacks because it's your stomping grounds or at least part stomping grounds. Yeah, certainly my ancestors' stomping grounds. So my four of my maternal ancestors settled there in the early 1800s. They came from other parts of New England and Southern New York. And it's a little unclear why they moved there. There were some New York state government initiatives to populate the northern part of the state, and they became farmers. They had small farms there um, alongside the banks of a river, which oddly, although it was um, mountainous, rocky terrain, right by this river was fertile agricultural land. My ancestors were like the working class people who were trying to make a living from the land in the early 1800s. By the early 1900s, the government created a public works project to flood the river and to essentially buy out the families that had farms nearby. But the problem was the payout was not nearly worth the value of the land. And so my ancestors were displaced just to the south of the Adirondacks, which is where my mother and my grandmother were born and raised. My grandparents did end up building a cabin there in, uh, in the near the site of their ancestral home in the 1960s, and my family and I still go there to that cabin today. So I've spent many hundreds of hours, many weeks, many months in the Adirondacks, but I've never lived there year round. So this is following your previous novel. It's another mystery that this one is quite involved, jumping back and forth in time and lots of different characters on which suspicion is cast at various points of the novel. But how do you start writing a mystery or how do you start writing this mystery? What comes to you first? And then how do you 
build upon it? And how do you know you're building upon it in a way that is going to work out as opposed to just muddying the whole thing? I never outline in advance. So I, I had published three novels before Long Bright River that were not categorized as mysteries, although I've always been interested in telling a kind of propulsive story. And so even my earlier novels contained within them a sort of mystery, although they weren't classified that way. I've never, with any of those novels or with my most recent two novels, I've never outlined in advance. So the only things I know going in are where the the, the setting, so the place where the novel is set and the time period. And I know at least a few of the main characters who will populate that place. And I know only the uh, the the first problem that they face. So in screenwriting, I'm doing a little bit of screenwriting these days, and I would call that like the inciting incident. So in the case of The God of the Woods, I knew it would be in the Adirondack Mountains in the 1970s. I knew it would be about the Van Lahr family and some of the local people nearby. And I knew that the Van Lahr's daughter would disappear from the summer camp that they founded. But that's all I knew. So I didn't know anything about the dual mystery that would emerge. I didn't know even where both children had gone or whether they would be alive or not, or what had happened to them. And I'm bearing in mind not to spoil anything. We'll save that for later. But all of that came in the writing and and I had to discover the answers to those questions kind of alongside the family and the investigators and the the characters. That seems very stressful. <laughs> it is. It was and is. Um, every time I write I convince myself that like I can't possibly stick the landing and that I've written myself into a corner and that I have to like jump ship. But the only constant between that I take from novel to novel is that I always have that feeling at various times and that I can go back to the to the most recent fork in the road and just take the other fork for a while. And usually <laughs> that leads me to some other path that feels better for the book. I mean, I, I think a lot of writers find writing difficult but of course the thing about a mystery is if if done well it all needs to make some sort of sense in the end and so that's this i imagine that's this other layer of um of stress or responsibility to the book that that y you have when you're working on something like this not only do character motivations need to make sense not only do the the sort of thematic seeds that you have planted need to sprout in the right way but it also the, it needs to be a satisfying mystery. How do you approach that problem? Yeah. The answer to the question, the central mystery for me in my books can't just be logically correct. I think it also has to be thematically correct and the characters have to grow in some way or discover something. I basically ask myself the question at a certain point, like, why am I writing this book and why am I writing it now? And what am I trying to say that feels new or different or important in some way. And then that makes my life a lot more difficult because I can't just answer the question. I also have to answer it in a way that I think says something that is relevant to my understanding of the world in its current state. <laughs> Are you a mystery reader? Were you a mystery reader? Are you reading at the cabin in the Adirondacks in the summer pile of paperbacks? I have always loved to read mysteries. I am still an avid consumer of mysteries. As a teenager, I got really into the golden age of detective fiction. So I read a lot of British lady writers, obviously Agatha Christie, also Dorothy Sayers I was really into, Niall Marsh, who's from New Zealand originally. I read all of those. I got very into more contemporary writers of mysteries as a late teenager and 20 something. I got really into Walter Mosley. I got really into eventually Dennis Lehane, ton of French people who I still read and really admire. So this is a summer camp book or book set mm -hmm. rather at a summer camp. Did you ever go to summer camp? I did go for two summers and much like the characters in the novel, um, there's a character called Tracy who's our window into the camp from an outsider perspective because it's her first summer going and she quickly realizes she's 12 and she quickly realizes that most of the other kids there have been going since they were seven or eight years old. So she enters late. And that was my experience of camp too. I, I believe I was about 11 or 12 the first time I went. I only went for two summers and even within, I, I think I only went for about three weeks each time. I did not enjoy it at all. It was a very different, it was in the Adirondacks, but it was a very different type of camp than 
Camp Emerson, which is the name of the camp in my book. It was not a camp. It was a very no frills camp, but it's still emphasized skills like survival and outdoorsmanship. And we did do a sort of trip into the wilderness for three days at a certain point, better supervised than the one in the novel. But yeah, there were were certainly like some of the sense memories of the camp were based on real life. Yeah. What were some of those sense memories? Um, The kind of natural amphitheater that's formed by logs that served as benches with a kind of bonfire down at the base of the amphitheater near the lake was drawn pretty directly from the camp that I went to. The smell and the look and the unfinished quality of the cabins that each that housed each camper, the fact that the counselor and the CIT were housed somewhat separately, but also still very much within the same room as all the campers came from my camp. And I don't know, it's all variations on a theme. I'm sure that A lot of people who've been to sleepaway camp of any kind will recognize, especially in the Northeastern United States, will recognize some of the atmosphere. There's a big, at the beginning of the book at least, underlying understanding of the danger of the woods. Obviously, this at the beginning, this 13-year-old girl goes missing. She's in the woods. Who knows what can happen in the woods? One of the first things they tell people at this particular camp is, when lost, sit down and yell. How do you think of the woods? How did you think of it when you first started as a child? And how do you see them now? I love the region. I find myself instantly transported to a kind of spiritual realm when I'm in the deep woods. But I don't have a lot of my, some of my family, my cousins who live in the Adirondacks, actually my own mother is a, they are very good outdoors people and they know a lot about survival skills that was not transferred to me. I would not survive long (laughs) in the wilderness. I don't camp today, but I have great respect for people who do. I think there's one of the epigraphs at the start of the book is by the the outdoors woman and ecologist Anne LaBastille, who's a very well-known figure in the Adirondacks. And she wrote a series of books called the Woods Woman Trilogy about, and, and it was about, they were nonfiction books about her time living as a hermit in the Adirondacks. And she talks about how the peril of of the woods and the beauty of the woods are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And that is an idea that really resonated with me and that I tried to bring up at various points during the book. And I, I had a good time doing research about like how people actually, the mechanics of actually getting lost in the wilderness and found in the wilderness. And I did some technical research into that as well. That's an interesting way to put it. What are the ways, what are the mechanics of getting lost in the woods? So there is a book called Lost Person Behavior, and I don't remember the name of the author or authors, but that's one of the books that I read as part of my research into how people actually get lost and how people actually get found. And the really interesting thing is that different demographics have different habits when it comes to attempts to getting unlost when they are in the wilderness. So for example, children exclusively or almost exclusively just walk downhill wherever they are. So if you're trying Hmm. to find a child who's been lost, just walk downhill and often you'll find them there. Men between 30 and 40 might always walk uphill, or I made that one up, but that's the gist. And I thought it was really interesting how predictable humans are when it comes to what they tend to do when they panic. I also read repeatedly, and this is something that was also instilled in me as a child, that the best thing that you can do if you do find yourself lost in the woods specifically is just to sit down and yell. Or another way to put it is hug a tree and blow a whistle or whatever. Because it's really when one is overconfident and thinks, oh, the trail must just be over there a little way, I know, or I I can just follow this stream for a while. That's when becoming inextricably lost most often occurs. Did you ever get lost in the woods? Yes, I was never by myself, but I do have a vivid memory of hiking with my mother and when I was a child and realizing at a certain point that we were bushwhacking for a long time. And I remember my mother putting on this, I didn't realize she was faking it at the time, but maintaining calm. And only after we were out, did she reveal that, in fact, she had lost the trail. She didn't know where we were. She defied the um, advice to sit down and yell, but she also (laughs) is, has, she's much more wood savvy than I am. So I guess she felt she she had not overconfidence, but confidence and the idea that she could probably get us unlost. And she did. What do you tell your kids about how to navigate the woods, how to treat the woods with respect? 
Exactly that. It's the, there's a phrase that's repeated a lot in the book and it's actually on a, it's mounted on the wall in various places around the camp. And the phrase is when lost, sit down and yell. And that's what I've told my kids or using different words. But also when we're in the cabin in the woods, which from which we can see no neighbors, I do let them roam. We live in the city of Philadelphia. And so they very rarely have a chance to go out and explore without the presence of an adult. But they have to be able to see the house at all times, no matter where they are. So they can never lose sight of the house. And that's my general rule for them. What is it like for modern kids, observing your kids who grew up on technology to go out and maybe not have access to the things that they have access to when they're at home? It's wonderful. So our in our cabin in the Adirondacks, we don't actually get cell phone service. It's one of those few remaining places in the U.S. that where no cell phone carrier reaches. And we, Scary. Yeah, and we don't, we have a landline, even scarier. Okay. And we don't have internet access either. At one point, there was an attempt, like a satellite came to town and some people were able to gain access to it. And then the company said, oh, actually, we're repurposing this satellite for Canada. So we lost it. And I'm not mad about <laughs> it. So our kids have, and we, just as impressively in this day and age, we don't have any connection to the the internet or cell phone service when we're up there. And it's very restorative. I like it a lot. And I'm I'm okay with the satellite being used for Canada. Canada can have it. What what do they do? Oh, they read. My older daughter is an avid reader. My younger son is just going into kindergarten, so he's not there yet. He likes Legos a lot. He likes building things. They pretend to go camping in the driveway. So they'll bring a sheet and stools and set up a tent and get little snacks from the fridge and put towels down and go to sleep and wake up and have a whole life cycle in the fake tent in the driveway. That kind of stuff. They'll build, there's a rock on the lake that they can build, they play house on it and they'll designate one section as a kitchen and one section as a dining room and all that kind of stuff. So it's the same stuff that I did as a kid. It's just new again. I grew up in the city, so I did none of yeah. those things. So yeah. It sounds amazing. It's really cool. Yeah. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is the Book Review Podcast, and I'm Gilbert Cruz. I'm joined this week by Liz Moore, author of the novel The God of the Woods. Liz, your book is set in the mid-70s, 1975. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Because most of it, or much of it, rather, is set on this camp, it feels like you don't necessarily have to introduce your readers to a ton of period appropriate things like people aren't watching tv they're not talking about what's happening in the news but yet i suspect you had to do a bunch of research anyway around this how did you navigate that and then make the decision not to put a ton of that into the book What's really interesting about the Adirondacks is in a lot of ways it does feel trapped in time, partly because, as we were discussing before the break, of the fact that cell phone service doesn't reach a lot of the parts of the Adirondacks. And so my experience now of the Adirondacks isn't that far removed from the experience of somebody in the 1970s. But I also have family in the Adirondacks. I have cousins there who are my parents' generation, and they were born and raised there. And so I was able to interview them for their memories of the Adirondacks in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I also uh, interviewed a couple of state troopers, retired state troopers who had memories of procedure, investigative pr procedure among the New York State Police in the 70s. And I guess, yeah, I chose to set it in the 70s because I was very interested in the idea that the 70s was a period of a decade of so much social change between the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, the things that were either in full swing or even just post those movements, but all of them knocking on the door of this community that's so rural that it only the tentacles of those movements are reaching into it for the first time. And so you have a character like Louise, who's the counselor overseeing the cabin from which Barbara Van Lar goes missing. And she's like aware that just outside the door, there are these big movements of social change happening. And yet she is really trapped in this relationship where there's a big power differential between herself and her boyfriend, who's the godson of the Venlars. 
And she says a few times, it's 1975, things are changing, and almost to reassure herself as much as others. So yeah, I like that feeling of the world knocking at the door and this community being a little bit trapped in time. One of the characters, or the character, I feel that you see this impinging of the 70s is the female investigator, Yudita. She is assigned to the case. She is probably one of the first female cop, the first female police officer that either anyone in town has seen, anyone on the property has seen, or any of her fellow officers has seen. Yeah, she was an interesting character to write. She, the, I, In doing research, I discovered that the nation's first class of female state troopers did graduate at Albany in the early 1970s. And I found this picture of them that really inspired me. And I then imagined what would happen if one of them became promoted to the ranks of investigator, which is the word used instead of detective in the state police. So she'd be like the, like a double first. And her nickname in the novel is Judy. And she has to fight a lot of uphill battles in terms of being taken seriously and have all of her rookie mistakes scrutinized double because of her gender. But I also think the fact that she is a woman gives her access to certain things because she is underestimated and because, for example, her male colleagues look at her and imagine that naturally she'll be good at speaking with children. So she gets access to one of the campers who ends up giving her really valuable information that nobody else has gotten yet. And similarly, there's this kind of fictional, there is a serial killer <laughs> character who's hovering on the periphery the whole time, having escaped. And part of that was just because it felt right for a summer camp tale to have this spectral ghostly figure hovering off screen, which is kids at summer camp love to tell those stories. And so it felt right to include him for that reason. But also... That character is based on a real serial killer in the 1970s who did really haunt the Adirondacks, who, and my family has a lot of memories of being scared of him. She, Judy, gets access to him um, because he's specifically requesting to speak to a woman. And again, it is, it's a double-edged sword, I think, her femininity. How useful or not useful is it for you to have these Real life touch points, you know, the first female investigators in the nation, this serial killer who's operating in the Adirondacks and during this time period for you to riff off of. I'm delighted that I write fiction because I love being unencumbered by reality. <laughs> I think that facts and real historical episodes can serve to me, at least, as very good sources of inspiration, but I love having the freedom to just take the heart of them and write something that a large percentage of which comes completely out of my imagination. A big part of the structure of The God of the Woods is um, not only jumping around between characters, but jumping around between times in those characters' lives. How, how did using that structure make it easier or more difficult to tell this particular story? I've written other novels with multiple points of view. In this case, it's all close third person. So it's not written from the point of view of the characters, but it's really inside their heads in, in a, a variety of different characters. We see, we're able to see their thoughts. But in this case, I had never written a, a mystery using a cast of characters like this. My last novel, Long Bright River, was a, from the first person point of view of a single character, and we get only her perspective. This time around, I liked the idea of a real ensemble piece where everybody has different points of view about each other as well. So there are certain characters who never get a, a close third point of view. For example, Barbara Van Lahr herself, the child who goes missing. But I loved being able to describe her in five different ways based on who was speaking about her so that the reader is the only, is left to determine who they believe. And I think in a mystery that it, it, you end up having the experience of being an investigator yourself, because I think the same would be true of an investigator coming in to determine the cause of disappearance for uh, a child who's gone missing and speaking to all these different witnesses or people who knew her and getting a very different impression of her from everybody and, and having to try to figure out who's telling the truth or who's distorting the truth. So that was a really interesting exercise for me. And when you're working on a mystery like this again, how do you, 
How do you know when is the right moment to parcel out a particular piece of information? Do you find yourself moving revelations between chapters earlier in the book, later in the book? It's a math problem at a certain point. I let myself just write whatever I feel like writing for a very long time. When I'm in the, when I'm generating a first draft, even if that means skipping into a completely different point of view from one set, set writing session to another. But at a certain point, I do have to get organized and I have to organize the, dra- the draft. And yes, as I lean more and more into writing mysteries, the question of how do I maintain narrative tension comes up for me in second and third drafts and fourth drafts and fifth draft. And some of that is like, what would be a, a rhythmically interesting way to end this chapter? And also what would be a turn, an interesting turn that raises a question that isn't answered until later. So it's, you know, throwing a baseball up and then catching it three chapters later. And there's not a science to it, but it's something that I do play around with. I must have reversed the, or scrambled up the order of all of the chapters in this novel dozens and dozens of times. And you're keeping track on like a conspiracy board? What are you doing? <laughs> a murder board. No, a <laughs> word doc. Just a word doc. I This is this novel. Oh, that's much less interesting. Yeah. I, I know. This is the first novel I ever tried to use Scrivener. Mm-hmm. I tried and failed. I got really excited about it because somebody pitched me on the idea that you can just lift whole chapters and move them around with ease. And that worked for me, but I... I got over eager and I didn't read the instructions in advance. And then in trying to <laughs> download it at the end, it was so mangled in formatting that it took like hours and hours to unmangle it. And so I just went back to Microsoft Word. Yeah. But I do have a running chronology in Word of every name and date and place and event. And as I move those around, I fix the chronology simultaneously so I can keep track. So Liz, you referred earlier to screenwriting. And the reason you're able to refer to it is because you are the co-creator, you're an executive producer on a forthcoming adaptation of your novel, Long Bright River. And I'm curious about the differences as you see it between sitting alone in a room, writing a novel through five drafts and, and working on a TV show in this sort of environment. The technical differences between screenwriting and fiction writing for me are in that I'm suddenly allowed to use the visual, but I'm not allowed to use the interior (laughs) if I don't want to include, if I don't want to include like a, a, you mean a character's interior thoughts, a character's interior thoughts. Exactly. If I don't want to use voiceover or anything like that. So. I have one tool taken away from me and one tool given to me. And I also have to really sharpen my or rely on my ear for dialogue more when I'm screenwriting. And that's very interesting to me because dialogue is something that I've really had to work at as a fiction writer. It's never, that's probably the thing that has come least naturally to me in fiction. I love eavesdropping on conversations. I sometimes just station myself in public places just to hear the way people talk. But it's been, so it's been fun and frightening to, to have to rely so much on pure dialogue and action and to have no ability to transmit the thoughts in a character's head without having them do something or say something. But it's probably been good for me as a fiction writer as well. How does one, or I guess, how have you gotten better at dialogue? How, do, how does a writer get better at writing? fictional dialogue for a novel? My rule of thumb for my novels is to use dialogue only when necessary, which is to say that I use dialogue when it can't be said a different way or when it is very revealing of when a particular turn of phrase is very specific or poetic or revealing. But other than that, I'm happy to say he talked about his childhood. He talked about just to describe it in general terms. The God of the Woods actually is pretty dialogue heavy in various scenes, especially there's a lot of interrogation scenes where I had to use dialogue, but those are all labors of love for me. They're not my most preferred moments of writing. Okay. Book review podcast listeners, we are going to talk about the ending of this book, which I selfishly want to ask Liz more about. So if you have not finished the book yet, We've given you a very good conversation. Feel free to step away and come back at a later time 
and listen to the rest of the podcast. So this is your warning. Please heed my advice. Please leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Liz. So when did you know what had happened to Bear Von Lahr? I began to understand what happened to Bear as I began to understand Bear's mother's backstory and her trajectory as a character. Alice Van Lahr, his mother, is somebody I really did not like. And I'm always very aware that there's a whole complex way that we speak about female characters being likable or unlikable that I wish to avoid. But <laughs> Alice is not nice to her staff. She is really hard on her own daughter. And entering her mind was not pleasant for me at the start of the novel. And yet, as I began to write her character, I came to have more sympathy for her and to understand her as somebody who was basically just almost auctioned off from one family to another in the early 1950s, seen as perceived as somebody without much intelligence or value other than her appearance and her ability to be mute, unchallenging, to provide an heir to the Van Lahr family and to not question anything. And I think in writing the scenes between her and her son, which were so full of love and tenderness, I began to understand that was her only experience of love in the world. And I also began to understand that the worst possible thing that could have happened to her was not only to lose her son, but to be directly or indirectly the cause of his death. And suddenly I realized that's what happened to Bear. And then what happened to the Van Lars is they placed their own obsession with their reputation and their capital over the well-being of Alice, of subsequently Barbara, and of the community that they employ. And that is the beginning of the Venlar's downfall as well. So thematically, it made a lot of sense that Alice would have effectively destroyed the one thing that she truly loved, the one person she truly loved, because it's the ultimate act of self-destruction too. And once I figured that out, then the other puzzle piece became Barbara and TJ Hewitt, who runs the camp, who is also privy to this secret because her father has agreed to keep it for the Van Lars. It made sense to me too that she would, even though she was only four years older than Bear, that she would have some guilt over not only the way he died, but over her father's complicity in keeping this secret and framing an innocent man and she'd be working as an adult, as a, she's a young adult, but she's still an adult, to, to reverse this kind of generational curse by giving Barbara the chance to be self-reliant, to make her own decision about her future by protecting her until she's 18. There was a kind of like fairy tale quality to it or a mythological quality to it as well that I like because I think it also intersects with the title of the book. She's protected, she's kept safe in this island in the wilderness until she turns 18 and she's a legal adult and she can do what she pleases. That's a long time. That's five years. She has to stay on that island. She can come out at any time if she chooses to. She's just mm -hmm. given the option to not choose that life. So this revelation that it was really figuring out the mother's story leading to the understanding of what happened to bear this sort of wound that exists at the heart of the entire novel. Is that a spark? Is that a slow revelation? It wasn't an instant revelation. It was just like the first domino in a series of decisions that I had to make about what would have happened to the children. But there were many versions of their story that I played with as I was writing it. And those are some of the examples of things that would have been logically satisfying, but that didn't really appeal to me thematically, because they didn't mm -hmm. have any emotional resonance for me, or they were gruesome and horrible. And and I wasn't sure why I was telling that story. I didn't, I'm not interested. I love horror and I love reading horror, but I'm not yet interested in <laughs> writing horror because I'm not sure what I'd be adding to the genre, which has its own really wonderful history. Does that require you going back during your drafting process to rewrite Alice? Yeah. In order to add or subtract story, to insert 
sort of thematic elements that now that you know that she effectively is at fault for the death of her son that needs to be in there? Yeah, the birth scene, the the haunted, a friend of mine called it the haunted birth scene, came pretty late in the process where she's giving birth to Barbara, but uh, under the influence of various narcotics that the doctors give her, she sees a vision of her son and imagines him to be alive and is trying to alert everybody else that he's returned and he's come back and and he's slipping away again. And it, it was a really, that was an intense scene to write. Partly because of, I have my own children and I remember their births very well. And it was a, and yet it gave me so much sympathy for her, which is what I needed to have as a writer in order to not completely demonize her. There are, I will say, some characters. <laughs> Again, as I kind of lean more and more into genre, I actually take pleasure in writing some characters who are just like, they're bad guys, they're villains. Mm -hmm. They exist in the world too. <laughs> like, Not interested in making every character fully well-rounded. Some of them are just bad. Yeah. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Who was the hardest character to crack or figure out? Or what was the hardest beat of the book to, to sort of navigate? Probably the technicalities of how TJ and Barbara framed John Paul McClellan. Because... There were just a lot of things I had to think through regarding how they could have done that effectively and how to pace that part of the story so that revelations were coming at appropriate moments. That was the hardest story, part of the story architecture, the hardest character to crack, maybe Barbara herself, because she is really only seen through the eyes of others, except for right at the very end. And this too came really late. I had a complete first and probably even second draft before I decided to do this. I decided to write one chapter from her perspective, close third point of view, about the night she left and about her decision to the way she set up her little cabin on this island and the things she brought with her. And it was really cathartic for me to be able to do that because it's the first time I was able to get inside her head in that writerly way. And I really enjoyed spending that last moment with her before the end of the book. It turns out that many people in this novel know what happened to Bear Van Lahr. The grandfather, the father, the mother, obviously, the camp director, his daughter. Are they all at fault for this, what happens to this child? I think so. I think there's a real complicity that all of them share for covering up the truth of what happened to Bear and allowing an innocent man to take the fall, to have his reputation damaged forever, even posthumously. But I also think there are certain characters who are able to undo their complicity, and I'm thinking of the Hewitts. Vic Hewitt is a character who's ailing by the present of the novel, but he made the difficult decision to keep quiet, to protect the secret of the Van Lars. because of his great concern for his daughter, who's very unusual in her day, and who he imagines won't have a traditional life, maybe won't ever get married, won't have children. And especially in the in 1961, when Bear disappeared, he asks himself, what will she do? What can she do in this world aside from working for this family that really um, fuels the economy of the region? And so he makes a choice to side with the Van Lars, but has never felt at ease with it. And his own daughter certainly doesn't feel at ease with it. So the Hewitts are working to undo their complicity, or at least I think TJ's working to undo her complicity and by extension, her father's complicity in this decision. Liz, this was just a very entertaining read. It sounds like it was very <laughs> difficult to write. <laughs> Listeners, if you never think about how many drafts an author has to go through to get to their final product, hopefully listening to this interview and this podcast will give you more insight into that. Liz Moore, thank you so much for joining the Book Review Podcast. Thank you, Gilbert. It's been a true pleasure. That was my conversation with Liz Moore about her new book, The God of the Woods. I'm Gilbert Cruz, editor of the New York Times Book Review. Thanks for listening.